Rocky, I don't know what happened on this Rock the Nation night here, but man, the power of God was moving. When you guys started singing, I just thought I was going to have to run around the building, man. What happened? <laughs> power of God. It was at this service in such a special way. We, we started in the prayer room, and it happened from the prayer right down the stairs, right onto the platform. It was like the, the Holy Spirit had his way. It was awesome. Man, I could feel it. When I walked in, I guess about halfway through worship, I thought, what is going on in this place? It's Memorial Day weekend here. You know, when this is being taped, you know, it'll be aired quite, you know, quite a bit later. But, uh, man, oh, man, this is going to be a tremendous program for the viewers to see. And I just want to encourage everybody that you want the power of God in your life. Join in. Get in with these songs. Start singing, lifting your hands, and getting with it right there in your room. And I'm going to be back later on with a special message of about how you can hear God to reach and fulfill the vision that God has put in each and every one of our lives. He's got a vision in your life, doesn't he, Rocky? He sure does. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. We're going strong. We're going strong for that vision. I, the devil will try to attack in all kinds of ways. You know what? God will see you through. Welcome to Rock the Nation. We hope you like this. He gave us like a dial on the cross for our sins. Man, he didn't even know us. We didn't even care about him. We were born in this world, we didn't know who Jesus was. And he gave his son, not knowing if we would ever come to him or not. Not knowing if we would even care. He gave his son because he loved us so much. Because his face shines on us. Because he loves us. Because his favor is in our lives. He loves you. You have favor with God tonight. You have favor. You can confess that in your lives every day that you have favor in the name of Jesus. God wants to give you guys the desires of your hearts. He wants to make your lives great. Christians should have the best lives in the world. So many of us walk around with our heads down. Oh man, I gotta live for Jesus. Gotta give up this. Gotta give up that. Man, this is the best life.
in the world. Amen. This is the coolest. That's right. You guys who are Christians, you guys are the coolest people in the world. That's right. You guys aren't like, you know, the you know, run of the mill, like scum, like the unpopular people in the in the school. You guys are it. You guys are making it happen. Yes. Amen. You guys are awesome. That's right. Christians. Make your face to shine on us. Hallelujah. Keep playing that. I want you guys to really worship tonight. To this song, you know, talking about being the coolest in school. When I was in school, in one of those classes we had was English. English was one of my favorite subjects because I loved poetry. And I loved when we started reading those poems, like those love poems and stuff. I love those. They're great. But like Annabelle Lee, you know, stuff by William Shakespeare and everything. That stuff was so great. <laughs> but man, you guys, you probably some of you guys didn't like poetry too much, did you? Poetry wasn't your thing. Poetry, you know why poetry wasn't your thing? It's because to really understand and to really get what the writer's saying, man, you gotta put yourself into what they wrote. You make your face to shine on me. And that my soul knows very well. What's that mean to you? What's that mean? It's not just a bunch of words that somebody needed to fill in a tune with. I mean, that's art. This is the arts. We're doing the arts. But we gotta appreciate what we're doing. You know, dancers, dancers in the world and stuff, they put themselves so much into what they're doing, dancers do, man, that you just like get right in there with them, like, oh, oh, that's great. What are they gonna do next? You know, and singers and stuff. Writers, you guys that love to read novels and stuff. Why do you like to read them? Because when you're reading them, you get right in the middle of that book. And you're like, what are they? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Man, Christianity is a whole bunch of what's going to happen next. I mean, you never know what's going to happen next. I mean, you just got to put yourself into it, man, and appreciate the words. You make your face to shine on me and that my soul knows very well. Man, no matter what we do, our soul knows that God is the answer. God is the answer. He saved our souls from hell from death, from the grave, and we have everything and every reason to praise him tonight. And just think about these words. You lift me up, I'm cleansed and free. You lift me up, man, we are not down, we're up. We're up all the time. We are seated in high places with God. We're up there. It's awesome. Just think about that as we sing this. You make your face to shine on me, let my soul know it's very well. You lift me up. You lift me up. I'm cleansed. I'm free. Let my soul know it's very well. Oh, no, very well. 
No, the word of God says that God inhabits the praises of our people. When we get more, when we get like these breakthroughs in this praise and worship thing in our personal lives and in our church, man, it can just make us mount up with wings like eagles. It can make you soar. It can revive you like no vitamin can. I mean, you can be wiped out. You can not sleep or whatever and walk in. And when the presence of God is in the place, man, it can change your body. It can make your body do. It can refresh you. It can make you more alive. And people come in and they say, man, being a Christian is so hard. Being a Christian is so hard. Not if you get in the presence of the Lord. God makes it all much better. Hallelujah. God didn't give us a, a, a big hard life and then say, and you're on your own. How many are glad God didn't say, well, I'm going to fix your life up and then pitch the ball to you and say, now it's yours. I'm done with it. Don't mess it up again. How many would have been out of the game already? Let me see. How many are glad he says, hey, we're going to work together on this thing. And if you fall down seven times, you can get up eight times because my mercy endures forever. Somebody shout amen in here tonight because we need his mercy. I want to talk for a few minutes about the elements of vision, the elements of a successful vision. I want to turn to a different scripture than I normally turn to. I want to turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk, you know, I want to try to, in my life, read all the minor Old Testament prophets because I'd be very embarrassed to get up to heaven, walk up to Micah or Habakkuk, and they're hanging out up there, and maybe they look at you and they say, Hey, while you were down there, did you read my book? And we're like going, see, where's Isaiah? I read him, uh, Jesus. We're going, Micah, <laughs> I, Habakkuk, Nahum. I want to read all these like minor prophets because, you know, hey, we're going to meet these guys when we get to heaven. We really are. We're going to talk to them. When they, when they say, did you read my book? We can say, yeah, I read your book. It was good. Bless my life. It's the word of God. The Spirit of God inspired Holy Spirit inspired Habakkuk in chapter 2. And I want to read this, and then we're going to pray. And I know God's going to infuse your heart and your mind tonight with the revelation that is in this verse. Not because I'm speaking it, because I believe God wants you to get it. In Habakkuk chapter 2, in verse 2, he says, The Lord answered me, and he said, Record the vision and inscribe it on the tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens towards the goal. It will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight. We thank you, Lord, that you've given each and every one of us vision. Lord, I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus tonight concerning the vision that you have given us corporately and individually. Infuse us with energy, Lord, not just to see the vision, but to pursue the vision and to accomplish what you have called us to do. Lord, you said you have a plan for us, and that plan was a good plan, a plan to give us a hope and a future which the world is desperately looking for. We receive the word of God tonight in the name of Jesus, and everybody said... Amen. Habakkuk said a few things here in chapter 2. He said, number one, he said, write the vision. Number two, he said, run with the vision. Number three, he said, wait on the vision. And number four, he said, you'll win with the vision. And I believe if we do all four of these things in our life, we will get to the fourth level, and that is winning or achieving the vision God has for you. Now, let me back up just a little bit and say... That vision is a God-given revelation of your future. A God-given plan, a God-given goal, if you will. Something that God shows you that is a plan of a preferred future, a good future. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans that I have for you, and they're good plans. Somebody excited about good plans? I am. I'm glad we don't serve a, a, a God who says, well, I'm into being demented and tormenting my kids. I'm into like, now some of you, we laugh at this, but some of you were like this with your toys when you were little. I know I had G.I. Joes, and I didn't always make them win. Sometimes I tortured my G.I. Joes. I would make them go into battles that I knew they could not win. Our senior pastor, David Wagner, every 4th of July, used to love 
to pick a frog to be an astronaut that would go up in one of those rockets and July the 4th, and get one of those high-powered rockets, and he'd find a frog, and he'd say, you want to be an astronaut, don't you? And he'd strap that little guy on there. Oh, you frog lovers, I know you're still going to love our pastor. But God is not a demented God up there trying to do weird things to you and weird things to me. He says, I love my kids, and I have a good plan for you, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you, a plan to give you a future and a hope plan to bless your life that's God that's our God he wouldn't do anything that you wouldn't do to your kids in fact Jesus said that he says even though you're natural and have tendencies towards evil he said the Holy Spirit God wants to give good things to those who ask him but a vision is a God-given revelation of your future now the first thing that Habakkuk said was he said you need to write the vision down now first of all I want to tell you how to get to your goals and your plans in life. Is that okay tonight? First of all, many people miss it on this point right here. They never write down what God tells them. You ought to have a book or a spiral notepad somewhere in your house. And every time you get something from the Lord, you ought to write it down in that book. When you go and you pray and you read the word and God begins to reveal things to you about your life and about your future, you need to write it down. If you don't have the energy to write down what God said, you probably won't have the energy and the discipline to do what God said. Somebody says, well, I don't know. Why do I have to write it down? God said it's part of the process. You know, they did a study at Stanford University several years ago, and they took an entire graduating class, and they asked them to write down their goals and their dreams. They said, write down what you want to accomplish in life. Only 3% of that class was able to put in writing what they wanted to do with their life to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. Five years after that point, they went back and did a study on that class, and they found that the 3% that wrote down their goals accomplished more in life than all of the other 97% combined. They built more businesses, they made more money, they affected more lives, they went farther in their life than all of the 97% who could not write down their goals. Now I want to tell you something tonight, there is power in writing your goals. There's power in planning, there's power in goal setting, but I want to tell you something, there's real power in God-given goals. The goals that God gives you. Because as a Christian, your destiny is not decided, but as a Christian, your destiny is discovered. When you go to the Lord in prayer, when you seek His face, when you worship His name, when you get into this book, the Word of God, and you begin to read it, and God begins to unveil to you little by little in stages by stages and by stages the vision that He has for you. And so you've got to be in a place, young person, young man, young woman, young adult, to where you can hear God's voice. To where when he speaks, you won't miss it. How many don't want to miss it? I want to hear what the Lord says. The importance of vision, Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, says without a vision, people perish. Their life has no direction. They run wild. They don't have a, a plan. God says you need a plan. You need a plan if you're going to do anything today. In fact, most people plan their vacation, spend more time planning their vacation than they do planning their life. Hmm? Dwayne's over here. He's making all these plans to be, to be married in November. Take a big vacation. I like vacations. I kind of like to go on one right now. I'm enjoying doing what I'm doing here, but I haven't had one this year. I'd like to go on a vacation. But you have to plan a vacation. You have to plan a service. If you want to have a service like this, we didn't just walk in here. We had to have somebody turn the lights on, get the camera set up, do the sound, do all this kind of thing. Band had to rehearse. Had to plan. You know, if I wanted to build a house, Chris, if I wanted to go down here, buy a piece of property on our Fosterburg Road down here, and, and I go down there and I say, I'm going to build me a house. But I don't need a plan. I don't need a blueprint. I just... I think I've seen that there Steve Spencer guy build, you know, he's a pretty good carpenter. And uh, I think I can, you know, bang nails in wood as good as anybody. And I don't need to hire anybody. Like, I don't even need a plan. I'm just going to go down here, Dwayne, buy me a piece of property off the side of Fosterburg Road. 
And I know houses are made of, you know, wood and brick, you know, use a nail and hammer and stuff, put that stuff together. So I go down here and I buy me a bunch of wood, a bunch of two by fours, a bunch of boards. That's a layman's terms, <laughs> boards. <laughs> so I say, hey, I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna build me a house. I don't plan, I'm just gonna build a house. So I just say, well, I think I'll take this board and I'll nail it into this one. I'm gonna nail that, I'm gonna put this board over here, I'm gonna nail that there. And I'm gonna come over here, I think this board would look cool right over, I'm gonna nail this board right down here. I'm nailing away and I'm putting stuff out there. Probably after a few days, I could have all of you out to my house to view what would very likely be one confused mess of plywood, nails, and brick. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't have a plan. I could go out there and put boards together, but it ain't gonna be a nice house. Now, if I was to hire Steve to build me a house and he gets a blueprint of what I want to build, and we get the right kind of boards and the right kind of nails and the right kind of brick and have somebody who knows what they're doing work within the blueprint, I'm going to end up with a house that is very near or maybe even exactly what that blueprint says a house should be. See, Paul said, I don't go at this Christian life as without aim. I don't box like I'm beating the ear and trying to find somebody, trying to, trying to find the enemy. He says, I make my punches count in life. And see, many Christians are against planning. They take a few scriptures like Jesus said, don't take thought for tomorrow. And they think that means never plan anything. He was talking about worry. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. God plans things, you know that? He planned the marriage supper of the Lamb 2,000 years in advance. How about that for a daytimer system? God does some planning. Your vision is your direction. write your vision then you got to do the second thing you got to run with the vision he said write the vision so that he may run that readeth it now what that means is this you need to write your vision down so clear that anybody who reads it can understand what you're saying write the vision and make it plain that he may run that readeth it so we need to be writing things down that God gives us in such a fashion that when you read it, it motivates you and it's very clear what your plan is. And then you become a doer of the word of God. James chapter 1, verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers only. Prove yourselves doers of the word. See, we've got a lot of people in life that are dreamers, but not a lot of people in life that are doers. You can be a dreamer and dream big dreams. I've had tons and um, tons of people come to me and say, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We've got a dream to do this. We're going to go over here. We're going to build that. We're going to build this. Five months later, how are you doing on your dream? Well, we ain't doing anything yet on it. It's usually people that don't write it down, too. Because if you don't have the discipline to write down what you're going to do, you probably don't have the discipline to do what you say you're going to do. Man, it's quiet in here tonight. So we've got to be able to be doers of the Word of God and not just dreamers. See, I want to encourage everybody here tonight to go to the Lord and ask the Lord for a one-year plan for your life. 
Then say, ask him for a two-year plan, then a three-year plan, then a five-year plan. You know, obviously, it will get a little bit more vague the farther out because God doesn't give you everything you're going to do in life all at once. He gives it to you in phases, in stages, and in steps. And as you obey what the Lord has told you to do, step by step by step by step. See, that's the part most people miss. They feel like they're going to get a vision from God. They feel like, okay, God gives me a vision, so if it's from God, I'll get it one day, and the next day... And it's all taken care of. Thank you, Jesus. And then when it don't all fall like ripe cherries from a tree from heaven, they go, well, I thought that was from the Lord. If it was from God, it should happen overnight, shouldn't it? And see, they get all messed up because they don't know the step by step by step by step. And here's the secret to your success in the vision that God has given you. You ready? Here's the secret. Your daily Routine. That's the secret to your success of your God-given vision is your daily routine. What do you do every day? Somebody says, I want to be an architect. I want to be an architect, and I know I have to study hard. But So if you're goofing off and, and you're never reading any books about being an architect, you're never studying great architects, you're never studying the, the things that you need to do to be an architect, then you're not really doing something every day to reach your goal, are you? And see, our thing as people is we want, we want to be the manager, but we don't want to pay the price and do what it takes to have management skills. We want to be the, the architect, or we want to have the, the high-paying jobs, but we're not, we're not ready to, to pay the price and make the sacrifice to do every day what it is necessary to be done, to discipline ourselves, to learn the art, to learn the skill, to learn to communicate. Somebody says, man, I want to be a great guitar player then you need to devote some time every single day to do what? Play guitar. Practice your guitar. And it works in every area. Whatever your vision is, whatever your goal is, take some time every day, your daily routine. So that's it. Write the vision. Run with the vision. Don't just be a dreamer, but be a doer of what God tells you to do. There's thousands and thousands of dreamers. There's probably only tens and hundreds of doers. But one of my favorite subjects in school was, one of my favorite all-time subjects in school was math. Math was it to me. I mean, I could do math. I could do math really well. And you know why I could do it? Unlike reading, I hated to read. I hated all this stuff. I hated to read. And I was like, second in my class, I had like four points. I never read a book. I hated going to the library. I thought it was, I was a nerd if I went to the library. I hated it. I didn't even know where anything was in the library. I didn't know where the books were. I felt like a total idiot in the library. But one of my favorite subjects was is math. You know why? I'm going to tell you. Because math, you go and learn one lesson. Here's how we did it. In math, our teacher gave us three problems every night. Three problems. And I went home and I did those three problems every night. And when I came in the next day, I knew exactly how to do them. And the next day, she gave us two more problems that built onto that three problems. And I'd go home and do that. And I felt so good about it. Because I could get those math problems just like that. The only reason I could get them was because I did them every day. It didn't work if I waited up two weeks and tried to do everything at once. That didn't work. Or if I waited till the end of the week when Saturday came and tried to do all my homework then because I didn't remember anything. But because I did it every day, I knew what I was doing. And it was great. And it came natural. And that's the way worship is. I was made to praise you. The only reason, man, the only reason, the only reason that we love doing it so much is that we do it every day. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a way of life. And every one of you can take five minutes out of your day every day and worship. And you'll be surprised the next day you'll want to do it seven minutes. I guarantee you'll want to do it seven minutes. You do it seven minutes, the next day you're going to want to do it ten. And it just gets built on and built on. At the end of the week, and you're in your room for a half hour, put on a cool praise tape, just worship, sing, even if you can't sing. You know, if you sing, oh, babe, you know, if you sing like that, it doesn't matter because it's beautiful to God. God's like, man, that's pretty. That is beautiful to my ears. Because it comes out of the heart. It comes out of the heart.
me read out of the Amplified Bible. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens until the end fulfillment. It will not deceive or disappoint. Though it tarry, wait earnestly for it. Because it will surely come. It will not be behindhand on its appointed day. Number three is wait for the vision. You know our problem? When God gives us a vision, and if it don't happen as soon as we want it to happen, if everything doesn't always go our way, if everything doesn't fall into place the way we think it should fall into place, what do we do? I'm going to quit. This don't work. Man, I'm, I'm doing something different. Now, I know people that if they're on a diet and then something don't go their way that day, they, they get mad at their diet. Uh, if they're on a diet and somebody yells, turns in front of them with their car, that's it, I'm eating five Twinkies today. Amen. You're punishing the Twinkies. <laughs> You're really punishing yourself, you know. Something don't go. You get in an argument with somebody, that's it, I'm eating a whole pie. I'm going down to Shoney's and ordering me one of them strawberry pies. I'm eating the whole thing. And, and see, we get upset. We're like that. I don't know why we're like that. It's weird, Dwayne. It's just weird. We're funny, we're funny things, aren't we, humans? So we've got to learn to wait on the vision. Now, here, here's what I want to talk about tonight. What do you do when your vision goes too slow for you? In other words, when you're like, man, I want this thing. God has showed me that I'm going to be a youth pastor. There may be somebody in here that wants to be a youth pastor. God has shown me I'm going to be a youth pastor. But I tell you what, nobody's even ever asked me to speak at their church. And it's just not going the way I want it to go. No, maybe I want to be a singer, and they have not even asked me to sing a special at church yet. Man, I'm going to go out and eat five Twinkies. What do you do when your vision seems to come slower than what you want it to come? The Word of God says to wait. Now, I looked up that word wait, and you're going to like this. Are you ready? Here's what the word wait says. Here's what it means. To sit expectantly for something to happen. To wait expectantly for waiting expectantly for something to happen. In other words, you don't just say, well, it's not going to happen, and you stand back. You wait, and you still have your faith out on the line. You're not discouraged. You just begin to exercise patience. And you just say, well, hallelujah, God is working on my behalf. The Holy Spirit is working for me. I can't even see it. You know, you think when the trees, when it gets winter, right now the trees are looking beautiful. You think when it gets winter that all the trees are dead. But you don't know in that time when it looks like they're dead, there's all kinds of little life things going on in there. And it's getting renewed sap for the next season. And we think, well, things aren't happening down at work the way I want them to happen. I'm not getting the promotion. I want to be making this much money at this time of the year. And it's, it's going a little slower. Now the Word of God says, wait, for it is for an appointed time. Turn to somebody and say, for an appointed time. Turn to somebody and say, the vision is for an appointed time. See, what that means is it's not all going to happen at once. The fulfillment of that vision will happen at an appointed time, and you just got to take it step by step. Now, here's what else that word wait means. That word wait means to carve out a place and entrench yourself in that place. To carve out and entrench yourself. In other words, when you're moving along in life and all of a sudden the devil's trying to slow you down or even worse, push you back, the Word of God says don't just go with the flow and turn around and go back and what the devil says to do. He says, carve out a place where you're at and say, hey, God has brought me this far and the devil may be trying to slow me down and push me back, but I'm going to carve myself out a place right here where I'm at on the track of life. I'm going to entrench myself right here and I ain't moving. I don't care what anybody does. I've come this far and I ain't going back anymore. I ain't looking behind me. I'm going to look ahead. And you say, well, Mark, I may not be going as, as fast as I'd like to go, but I'm going to wait on the vision because it's coming. It's coming. Turn to somebody and say, it's coming. Say, look up. God's going to do it for you. It's coming. 
What do you do when your vision goes too slow? What do you do when some people use the expression, all hell breaks loose? When the devil just throws a little tantrum because some, some victory that you've got in your life. Come on, people. You get some victory in your life and you think, hey, it's going to be great from now on. And then the devil throws a little tantrum, oh, yeah. tries to throw an attack at you, tries to push you back. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to see how God says that we're to handle that. Wait for the vision. So you can enjoy the journey when you know that God is working on it for you. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to start at verse 32. This is talking about some people that got saved in, in this town. Remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. Partly by being made a public spectacle, spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. People in the city were persecuting them because they were Christians. You showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. Some of their property was taken away from them, personal property. <coughs> Knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession. Somebody say a better possession. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. See, confidence has a great reward. When the devil comes against you, he says, don't throw away your confidence. You know what? He says, they took your property, but you know what? You have a better possession. What's he saying? What's a better possession than the property that they own? The very next verse, don't throw away your confidence. What's he saying? Your confidence is actually more valuable to you than the material thing that you owned. Your confidence that you're going to get it back, that you're going to gain back the ground that the devil tried to take from you. Your confidence is a more valuable possession. So he says you may have lost some ground. You may have lost your property, but for sure don't lose your confidence because that would be a worse thing for you than, than losing your property. Is if you lost your confidence that God was going to pull it through and he was going to reward you. He said, that's a more valuable possession than that property. Now look at the next verse. For you have need to endure so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Endurance. Somebody say endurance. When you stand the test of time, when you do what God says to do, when things aren't going well, then he says, you'll receive the will of God. What do you do when things go too slow? You wait expectantly. You carve a place out. You entrench yourself and you say, God's brought me to this place. I'm not going backwards. I may not be going forwards as fast as I want, but I am going to keep moving on. Now, what do you do when things don't go your way at all? Look at what this says. It says, you accepted joyfully the seizing of your property. Now, am I wrong, or does this sound like people who might be mentally insane when someone comes in and takes some of their property, maybe even their home, and they said, yes, I'm joyful because someone just took what belonged to me. I'm thinking, where, where are these people from? What city is this? What kind of church is this? He said, you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. I'll give you a hint what this principle is all about. We sang the song tonight. In every circumstance, I'll find a chance. A chance to thank you. I was made to praise you. I was made to love you. I was made to worship at your feet in every circumstance. When the devil comes against you, when things go too slow, when you had a fight with somebody that you really care about, God says I was made. God says you were made in his image and we can stand the test of time when we joyfully stand and worship him in the face of what darkness and the devil is doing. Come on, somebody. Help me preach tonight. God says that when you stand joyfully in the face of darkness, he said there's a great reward coming for you. 
said, don't worry about that property that was taken. Don't worry about that property that was stolen. He says, I'll give it back, but don't you lose your confidence. Don't you throw in the towel. Don't you lose your joy. You leave your hands lifted up and worshiping God. And then you'll do step number four. Because when you write the vision and run with the vision and wait on the vision, you will finally win with the vision. You'll receive what God has promised. You'll be walking in it one day and you'll say, this is what I wanted to walk in five years ago when I started believing God for what he showed me and I'm glad I didn't give up. Tony, I'm glad I didn't give up 10 years ago. I'm glad I didn't give up. You know, all kinds of people have come to me in the last 10 years of this youth ministry and said, well, we're going to build a, another building down here. We're going to build another youth ministry. We're going to build the Rock 2. We're going to build the Rock 5. Somebody else said, we're going to build this. This building's going to have this and that. And we're going to do this. And you know, I wonder where they're at today. And I look at you beautiful people and all the hundreds and thousands of people that have come through this place and been ministered to. And Kirk, I'm going, I'm glad I didn't give up when I was bummed out. I'm glad when the devil started shooting fiery darts at my head and said, you need to just throw in the towel. I'm glad I didn't. When a young person, a teen teenager comes up to me and says, I was saved last week and I am totally set free and delivered. I'm saying, I'm glad I didn't give up. I am winning with the vision and I'm not done yet because when you reach where God has showed you, you're going to reach. He keeps showing you bigger and better things. And I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm just 10 years here, but I feel like I'm just getting started in what God wants me to do. I'm not going down, I'm going up. I'm not getting older, I'm getting better. I'm getting faster, I'm hearing God better today. I'm preaching the word of God to myself. I'm speaking the word of God. And I tell you what, God says it's going to be bigger and it's going to be better because you took joyfully the seizure of your property. You kept the joy of the Lord in your heart all the days of your life. Somebody shout amen here tonight. Come on, God's good. You're going to win with the vision. You're going to win. Don't forget, right now, go somewhere and write down your vision. Whatever God has told you that he wants you to do in your life, seek him until you get at least a level or a stage of what he wants you to do. Then do something every day about that vision. And if everything doesn't go your way all the time, don't worry. God's still moving. Wait on the vision. It will surely come. We'd love for you to write us right here at Rock the Nation. The address is on the screen. Check it out next week. Help us to rock the nation. God bless you. Powerful anointing in this place tonight. Spirit of God is here in an awesome and mighty way. He's here to heal sick bodies, break yokes of